about an hour and a half. Almost about two nine, It's about 90 minutes. We had Klaus Kinski last week, so we went on and on and on. Klaus Kinski. Klaus Kinski. Yeah, he was, he was here, and... Uh, <laughs> he covered his films last week. He's dead. Yeah, I know, but we just covered no, his we, films. No, but not me. I probably bought him at an auction, and he's here next to me. <laughs> We showed a bunch so, of his trailers and posters and, you know. He was an interesting guy. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Spaghetti Westerns podcast. I am your host, Jay Jennings. And we would be uh, remiss if we didn't introduce our co-host, the wonderful Tom Betts. Hi, Tom. Hi, Jay. How are you? How are you? I'm doing good. Uh, we have a very special show today. We have an actor who is in a few spaghetti westerns. Uh, the one he's most memorable for is Return of Sabata. But not only is he going to talk about that, he's also going to mention what it was like, I guess, living in Italy and uh, making films and that whole lifestyle. So it should be an interesting show. Should we bring him on, Tom? Let's do it. Ladies and gentlemen, the one, the only, John Delaney. Hi, John. Hello. Hello to everybody watching. I'm very <laughs> honored to be here. Welcome. Thank you. We're honored to have you. Uh, John uh, is, in a, is in a few spaghetti westerns that we all uh, remember, just to name a few. Have a Good Funeral, Sartana Will Pay, uh, Price of Death, of course, Return of Sabata, which we'll talk about extensively. They call him Cemetery, The Long Ride of Revenge, which I call The Long Calvocate of Vengeance. Of course, the classic Jesse and Lester, Two brothers in a place called Trinity, and he was also in Fellini's Roma. Not a spaghetti western, but I still think work, worth talking about. So, John, uh, are you ready? I am. So, uh, John, you were born in uh, 1946 in Oklahoma City, correct? Yeah, makes me 37 and a half. <laughs> I'm not joking. Uh, and um, <clears throat> your, your dad owned uh, an aluminum windows and door manufacturing company. Yep. Uh, you attended uh, Harding High School in Oklahoma. So you're an Oklahoma boy, basically. I am. And there's a new film coming out called Stillwater. And uh -oh. it's, a, it's about uh, a, an oil well worker who works in Stillwater, which is just north of Oklahoma City, starring Matt Damon. I understand uh, it, it could be very good, very interesting. I'm going to see it. Oh, okay. That's where Chris Casey lives. <clears throat> you um... oh, No more. Yeah, he's back. Oh, I didn't know. <laughs> Back in Stillwater, yes, yes. Uh, permanently? Yep, he works at the uh, Oklahoma State University now. Well, that's, I thought that's where he always worked. Yep, well, he's back. Yeah. So, John, you went to Harding High School in Oklahoma City. Yep. Uh, then you went to a Columbia College in Chicago and in L.A. Yep. Learned filmmaking. Huh, uh, no. No, oh, you did, <laughs> you just stood in class and you took a nap. There was no directing uh, program. You want me to talk about Columbia oh, no, no, just mentioning that you have okay. a film background. and uh, No thanks to Columbia, I have to. <laughs> Basically from watching late night black and white movies, right? Watching classic movies, the great right. European classics, the great American classics. Right. Uh, at 19, you, uh, you worked uh, in a Hollywood film lab. Yeah. Well, what did you do there? That was called uh, Telefilm, owned by Nate Lieberman, a wonderful guy. He hired me when at first he didn't even need me just to be nice to me. Then it turned out that he did need me. And we did special effects and titles, aerial imaging, uh, color work, um, doing the colors in a film is adjusting the lighting actually. And we worked at 1635 millimeter. I have many stories to tell about it, except the most important was that I can't find any trace of Nate. I'd like to know what happened to him. He's a wonderful guy. And his wow. sister came out from New York and she, what a laugh, what a riot. So uh, we had, later, you, uh, you, you, did you make short films? You directed some films in New York? Yeah, I directed many in Hollywood, short educational films, about 12 minutes long, 16 millimeter. I bought a Beaulieu 16 millimeter camera. Nice. That took me some months to get the money together for that. And then I just started shooting. And I was shooting more or less uh, one film every week, uh, 400 feet, 16 millimeter, 12 minutes. Uh, it would be, well, it was longer than that, but I would edit it down to 12 minutes. And you owned a small cinema in the East Village. Yeah, you know, the American Experimental Cinema. And what did you show there? 
Well, I showed so many things, but one day I got an offer to uh, show the birth of a nation. Wow. wow. Just one second. See what? <laughs> your what? Telephone. I don't have your cell phone. No, yours. Oh, well, go take it. I'm so sorry. I'm being requested. I know your assistant. You got about three assistants, and they always need you, need you, John. <laughs> These escort girls are such a pain. <laughs> and, and, anyway, in '69, you left for Europe, where you be, uh, began your acting career. Correct? Wait, 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 wait. What? what? Why did you go to Europe? Oh, I was madly in love with Europe since I was a child, reading fairy tales and fables seeing the beautiful paintings and drawings of castles and the landscape, and then reading about the history of Europe. And, and then, of course, there were the Disney films where all, almost all were based on European fairy tales. And the whole idea of it was just fascinating to me. And it seemed to hit a, a place inside me that it really gave me a tremendous reaction. And then when I realized you could go to Europe and see these places, I had to go. So I, I was uh, right making films in New York for two years, and I had a cinema. But then I, I was really on my way to Europe all that time. I was just waiting until I could find a, a moment. Uh, so I, I hired a, a guy named um, Davis to manage the theater, and he continued running the theater when I went to Europe. And eventually he let it go. But um, so my idea of going to Europe was, a, I'm not very spiritual, but in this case, I would say it was a spiritual thing. I wanted to be associated with Europe. I wanted to live within it. I wanted to touch it and breathe it, smell it. I didn't know what it would mean to that me. It sounds like I a had, film itself, John. Well, why not? So I, you were more of a tourist going over there? You had no plans on working there? Well, I knew I had to work. I didn't have any clue as to what job I might get. I got gotcha. you. You I were just know. going to your... I, I was going, and I had a, a Volkswagen, a 1970 Volkswagen pop-top camera. Uh, later, I bought a... That was red. Later, I, we bought a white one. And uh, fortunately, in Rome, I, that was in northern Germany. I went to Holland to see a friend there, but it was too cold, December. So we decided to go to Rome to get warmer. I was going to go to Rome anyway, but I had no idea what Rome would mean to me. Right. And so going to Rome, uh, after about a week or two, there was an ad in the English language newspaper for, they were looking for a sound man, for a Hollywood production. And uh, I, went, I met the guy, Billy Byers Jr., and they hired me immediately. And I became the sound recordist for all four of the films that he did across Europe. Except I didn't go to Russia. I didn't want to go to Russia uh, because the, I had so many cameras. The Russians didn't, wouldn't let me in. That's another long story. <laughs> you might have met Dean Reed, John. Dean Reed. Oh, yeah. I'm just making a joke, of yeah. course. So after anyway. that, so let me ask you, um, did you, so at this point, you're not thinking I'm going to work in Spaghetti Westerns, or did you? I had no idea that I would be an actor because, young gentlemen, I'm, going to tell you the truth is that I never considered myself an actor. I didn't want to be an actor. I wanted to direct. I wanted to create the images that would stir the emotions of the viewer. That's the only thing I cared about. When I was 11 years old, I saw Seventh Heaven with Jimmy Stewart, and I just fell in love with the film. And I said, whoever made this film, I want to make a film that will have that kind of reaction to people. And uh, I never was able to do it because when I... After about nine months of working with this film company, traveling across Europe, all the way up to Helsinki and the Russian border, um, then I said, well, I've got to go back. I went back to Rome. No, I went to Spain. And in Spain, I read in Variety, the magazine, with the, you know, Variety, even they have them there. I read that Fellini was going to uh, start shooting a new film in Rome. I, instantly, I packed up everything, and I drove back to Rome. And I had a friend named Henry Krzyzewski who was, uh, he produced some good films, some westerns. Uh, he also owned a company, was the primary rental company in Rome for the most important film equipment uh, Fellini always rented from him. 
And Henry uh, told me where Fellini was shooting. So I went out there and uh, met Fellini. But maybe you want to get into Fellini later. Oh, okay. Yeah, we will, actually. So let, so your first spaghetti western that you're in, and as I said, we'll just, Tom and I will just go by these rather quickly or just mention them so the fans out there can understand. And then we'll talk about the film that you're, I think, most known for, Return of Sabata, with that great scene as the dueling judge, uh, was Have a Good Funeral, Sartana Will Pay. And I think uh, I have the, uh, the poster that, that we'll show. And Tom will tell us a little bit about uh, that film. Even though we've discussed it before, we'll do it once one more time, Tom. Yeah, we discussed this at the Garco films. But it's about uh, after witnessing a brutal massacre, the legendary hero Sartana, played by Johnny Garco, is ready to do some investigating. Almost everyone in the tiny town of Indian Creek seems eager to buy up the property left behind by the murder victims, and one of them could well be behind the killings. The sheriff, Luis Induni, himself is not above suspicion, so Sartana must uncover the culprit all on his own. Yeah, and it's, uh, it's 1970, ones, uh, directed uh, by Anthony Ascott. Right. Juliana, and as you can uh, see, who's Juliana in it Carmelo. is Johnny Garco, Antonio Villar, Daniela Giordana, George El Wang. Galeen. Yep, George Wang. And of course, um, John Delaney as a cowboy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was dressed as a cowboy. Right. That, that's yeah. about as far as I remember. Right. I'm, I'm from Oklahoma, but right. I'm Right. So I, it I just fit in. So that was your first spaghetti western. And then you went on to make six or seven more. Was this did you feel comfortable on the sets? Yeah. <laughs> Everything there. This, there was nothing daunting about doing these films. Uh <laughs> except for the return of Samantha. Uh right. I was scared to death. I was absolutely a nervous wreck. I you want me to get into it. Well, in a second, you you also in. Uh, we'll mention real quickly. You played a townsman in uh, the Price of Death, <clears throat> which is another Garco film. And this one was also with Klaus Kinski. But we talked before the show. You didn't remember much about either either gentleman. Well, when you're just an extra and you're in the, <laughs> in the street, oh, you're, too, you're too modest. Okay, when you're co-star. <laughs> but you're, you're paid as an extra, you're awesome. seen as an extra, All and right. you have no dialogue. You're not too important. <laughs> you're just standing around, and they say, "Walk here, walk there." You do that, and you go home. And uh, I, I can't say that I was uh, prying into the business. Of, you just don't. Uh, everybody has their job to do, and uh, it's not really appropriate. You go around and talk to people. They were all strangers to me. I had no idea who any of them were. So it wasn't like, oh, I'm about to meet this guy I knew and I've got to talk to him. Later, I did that for people like Jack Palance and mm -hmm. Lee Van Cleef and others. But uh, I, had no, I, I had no clue. Uh, I'd seen in uh, Hollywood in New York, Spaghetti Westerns, and I'd seen the earliest uh, Leone stuff, and I'd seen at least two Cori Uomo Cori and Pacha Pacha uh, with Thomas and, of course, Lee Van Cleef. And I had and Franco Nero. I had no clue when I was in Hollywood and New York that one day those faces I would be looking at and making films with. It was impossible. I, I That's had awesome. No and, and for those of you who haven't seen it, Tom, what's the what's the uh, story about? Well, this is the one about Chester Conway, played by Kinski, a crook accused of killing some people during a robbery in the saloon. He was sentenced to death. The owner of the saloon is not convinced of the guilt of Chester and hires a lawyer named Jeff Plummer, played by Frank L. Albini, uh, to collect evidence to exonerate Conway. Plummer, in turn, turns to Silver, played by Garco, a retired gunman, and offers a large sum to help him. Together, they begin the investigation. With cunning, Silver induces the real culprit to betray, him, betray himself and exonerates Conway. But in the meantime, it's discovered that at the time of the robbery in the saloon, there was also a killing of a young Mexican. Silver decides to deal with Conway and punish him for the heinous crime he committed. So basically, right. he frees Kinski, who's guilty, not guilty of one crime, but guilty of another. Right. We've talked about this film uh, during the Garco and, I think, Kinski episodes. Yep. And then, and then uh, of course, John came... Uh, that moment to shine 
in Return of Sabata as the dueling judge. You have quite a long scene in the casino. Uh, all the, I guess, um, uh, LVC, Lee Van Cleef, Sabata is going to have a duel with someone. Who, who's that? Who's the other guy he's having a duel with, Tom? I'm trying to remember. Does he have the duel with? Uh... I don't think he was an important character. I was oh, going to okay. say, it wasn't Reiner well, Schoen. He gets hit in the crotch later uh, anyway. Yeah. But um, uh, the, the henchmen are all, I guess they have different gunmen standing in the hallway or in the stairs, uh, I guess to shoot Sabat in case this duel doesn't go right. And from, from what I take from your character, uh, John, you're in on it too. You're part of that kind of gang. Would you say you're, you're kind of on the take? Probably. <laughs> I, I can't be... Sure. I mean, I have a story to tell about that if you want to hear it. Well, let's let's show let's let's first show everybody oh. uh, your character as the dueling judge. A very memorable look you had for this movie. I was twenty three. Wow! <laughs> and I asked before the show if that was your real hair, and you said it was. Was it I twenty four? Maybe. Anyway, yeah, that's my real hair, my real beard. It's just the face that's uh, completely. I don't know. Do I look the same? I, I'm sure did, I look the same. Uh, did you have a beard at the time, or did you grow it for this? No, no, beard? no. I, I had a beard for years before so, that. Okay, that's your old. natural look. Okay. Right. So it's kind of tell us, as I show different photos, how was it like on the set, or at least your first day? Were you starstruck, or? Well, I certainly knew who Lee Van Cleef was, and I had uh, enjoyed his film work in previous years, as anyone had, and I was just very moved by the Leone Westerns and the other films with Lee. So he was a huge star to me. <clears throat> when right. you go out, when you leave Rome to go out the Nomentana, Via Nomentana, the road, and you finally get to Alios, it's not too far out. Uh, there's uh, some office buildings on the left. You park on the right, you go in, there's uh, the production office and there's makeup. And so the first thing was that uh, you you go in for, I guess, the costume and then makeup. And I said, oh, this is a big production, a nice makeup they did. They had uh, really quality work done. And I, I wasn't used to, I wasn't expecting such complete Americanized uh, production values, but I found out later UA had picked it up. So it was pretty good. Um, then you go down and walk through another door or two until you get to the saloon, which was a casino in that. <clears throat> you walk from the rear and you come through a door and then you start seeing other people dressed as cowboys and you're dressed as a cowboy. And uh, all, all I'm doing is waiting for someone to tell me what to do or what to say. I had no idea who I was. If I would have dialogue, I knew nothing. They don't tell me. They don't tell me anything. It just, it just happens. And uh, Gianfranco Parolini, the director, a wonderful guy. I'd met him in his office in Parolini, uh, which is a exclusive neighborhood uh, of Rome, and he hired me from there. Uh, during this scene, in fact, he had a back problem, and there are the two acrobats. The actor, actor, uh, Vasily Karras, and yes. um, who's the other one, Tom? Uh, Nick Jordan, which is Aldo Conti. Right. <clears throat> so Gianfranco asked one of them, I forget who, can you, because Gianfranco was upstairs. See the stairs? He was up mm -hmm. there. Yep. And <clears throat> he said, Can one of you come up here and massage my back because it had gone out or something? So we took about 10 minutes for that to happen. And I guess he was better. And uh, then we continued working. And this scene here, you're asking for his gun for a fair fight or actually to make it unfair for him. And instead, LVC smiles and gives it to um, Spala. <laughs> yeah. It looks well, like you're about to shake his hand. The guy who he uh, has the duel with is right there in the middle, Tom. Who's that actor? Yeah, I still can't recognize oh, okay. him. Okay. It's not uh, Rainer Schoen, is it? No, Re no. Reiner, Reiner is sitting down. Oh, okay. He's uh, when when Lee says uh, I could use a helping finger now. Oh, that's he looks like William Berger a little bit. That's what I, when I was a kid, that's who I thought it was. <laughs> um, so then the the action was simple, but I have to tell you, 
I was absolutely scared to death. We showed this one. I guess I was 24 years old. And there was Lee Van Cleef. I have to say something. I hope I'm not going to hurt anybody's feelings. But there were two ladies there, and they were relatives of Lee. At least they seemed to be relatives. Uh, one was an extremely large woman, and the other one was younger and not as large. But these were both very large women. I never found out exactly who they were. I don't believe that they were either of them with his wife, who I believe is always, always thin. Mm -hmm. So I, I was always trying to figure out who were these women, but I never did. And, and you're still to this day, you're trying to figure out who they were. Apparently. Uh, because we're, we're talking just, about them now. The two we large women in Return of Sabata. Who were they? If you know who they were, chime in. Uh, uh, we're so, just looking at some some great photos here as you get the uh, the pistols ready for the duel. Um, so did you? So tell us a little bit about Lee. Did you have any conversations at all? Not really. Oh, okay. Just uh, our own dialogue. And that was it. Just go to your mark and. Hand the pistols, say this, say that, and what right, you see and of is... Of course, your famous line, but this time, instead of using silver dollars, we'll, we'll play with these. these. Yeah. And you're telling it wasn't your voice, you were dubbed. I'm uh, dubbed, and I, I've only dubbed two times in my whole life, once in the Philippines and once in Italy, but I've never dubbed myself, my own voice. Well, I think that was kind of silly. Did you did you expect to be dubbed, or you didn't... It didn't... Oh, no, I knew, I knew I was going to be dubbed. Everything is dubbed, except for Lee's voice, probably, I guess. And yeah. uh, when there's an important actor whose voice is important, they leave that in. Well, he'd, but, have, been, he'd have been his own voice in the English version, but he'd have been dubbed in the Italian versions and the German versions and stuff mm -hmm. like that. So, yeah. But you, did, you had no idea that you were going to have this role and dialogue until the day you showed up. I only knew I had a role. I didn't know how, how complicated it was. I had no, no way of knowing. No one told me anything until the day after they told me something. Got you. Wow. It's a, no, as I said, if for a small role, it's very memorable. It's one of those that stands out. Thank you. And, but let me tell you the, the real story. It's okay. the most, most bothering, bothersome story of my acting life is this. I was making 50,000 lira a day, which was $36 back then, but that was a small fortune. In fact, the average Italian, I looked it up, the average Italian was making about $36 a week, a month, sorry, a mm, month. A month, dollar a day, lira a day. Yeah, in 1970, 71. And there I was making 50,000 lira, they were making the same, but I was making it per day. So uh, at the end of the day, he says, uh, we'll call you for the next day's shooting. And I said, how many days do I have? He said, you have 17 days. <laughs> ting, ting. Now, was, that, was your scene in the casino, was that all shot in one day or is that over a course of days? One day, because the rest of the story is this. I said, oh, 17 days, he told me. So I left. When I got home, I called the production company. I spoke to the AD, I guess. And I said, well, I see I've got a pretty good part. How about giving me 75000 a day? <laughs> and he said, if they go for it, I'll call you back. They never called me back. <laughs> And I never, ever demanded more than they offered again for any film. Well, I did once. And they said, no. I said, okay, I'll do it anyway. <laughs> At 17 days minimum, I would have had as some kind of important character in that film with Lee. Yeah. And yet, because I was greedy, I thought, well, I'm American. I better demand more money. This is the way it's done. I didn't have an agent who's going to get me more money but me. 17 days, the mortification set in and it's never left me. Wait a minute, wait a minute. So you screwed yourself out of out of being on the set longer because you wanted some more Lyra. That's right. 
I said oh, 75,000. So, what and, a story. Yeah, and they didn't call me back. Yep. Uh, I thought they, they would have admired that, that this American has a balls. Uh. <laughs> Not well, anymore. I'll tell you, that, that's just terrible. Terrible story. I hate to repeat it. <laughs> okay, but, well, then we'll, 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 we'll end it on that note. So we just did a little feature on that. Uh, do you look back with that on Pride? Is that something you're proud of that you of did, Of course, John? of course. I, I'm very thrilled about it. In fact, when uh, my wife at the time and I went to the theater to see it, uh, the people behind me, when we stood up at the end of the film, they said, is that you? Is that you? <laughs> no one had ever, because I'd never done a film, except for that walk-on thing, Western, the year before, I guess it was. I, I never acted. And that was no acting. And I, I never wanted to be an actor. I'm very grateful that people have hired me to be an actor. But as I said, I just wanted to be a director. I ended up being a director, DP, a, never an AD, but DP. I've composed music for a film that I also produced, and I edited and so forth. But um, I really wanted to direct. I well, wanted let, to. Let, let's end on uh, on this. Let's show that your your this took up the whole the movie screen. So I mean, that, to me, that's awesome. You look from right to left with a smirk, like, okay, time to get this judging underway. <laughs> Maybe, maybe I was thinking, maybe tomorrow they'll give me a million dollars. How big is this role going to be? Well, I didn't know it was more than one day until the end of the day when he says uh, 17 days. I had well, no idea. At least Lee, Lee didn't call you half soldier. <laughs> <laughs> no, I still had my legs at that time. And <laughs> possibly. Huh? Oh, anyway, oh, yeah, I do. Uh, there I they are. Yeah. But uh, so that was a great experience. Um, and then you went on to make another, you worked again with uh, John Garko in They Call Him Cemetery. You played a cowboy. Uh, William Berger's in that, Nello Pazafini. And uh, Tom, you want to tell us a little bit how that film was? This is the one that's got the great opening theme song and the huge stagecoach comes riding in. It's bigger than the one from Duck You Sucker. But it's about two college-educated greenhorns, George McIntyre, played by John Fordyce, and John McIntyre, played by Christian Chattel, who arrive from Boston to visit their father. They find the unsettled and lawless West is not a place for unskilled youngsters. They also find out that their father, Clay McIntyre, played by Bill Vanders, and the other ranchers are being blackmailed by a gang of outlaws. The youngsters take it upon themselves to find out who's behind this, and put a stop to it. They are helped by the Ace of Hearts, played by Johnny Garko, a gambler, ladies' man, and expert pistolero. He teaches the young men to shoot and protects, protects them from another hired gun, Duke, played by William Berger, who has been hired to eliminate them. Yeah, it's a pretty good film. Yep. Um, we discussed this, I think, for the Garko and the Berger episodes as well. And then after that, I think we made the the second film you're probably more known for and that's the long ride of revenge john well i think you only had one day uh that was shot on the western set of chinichita <clears throat> that's where i met richard harrison for the first time and george wang i think i met him uh, that was the first or second time maybe george wang i asked him how do you say china in chinese <laughs> and i've never forgotten it chung kuo chung kuo Chung Kuo means China Kuo. In, in Mandarin. Yeah. He always plays a very loud, obnoxious, bombastic character. How, how was he in real life? Well, we got along great. We were laughing, sitting. I have no idea what we were talking about. But he was, as you see him in the film, he was loud and uh, uninhibited. And, and he and Richard were good friends already. And we had a lot of fun. Unfortunately, on that set, there were some uh, extras outside and there was a young looked like an american girl as an extra and i um i don't think it was a light but a flag some large flag of some sort that the wind blew and hit her in the head and sent her to the hospital wow. george? huh george wang no a girl no, outside. no a oh, the young girl, girl okay. an extra <clears throat> We all, well, I saw it. I saw it happen. At that time, I had my uh, red Volkswagen camper 
and Richard was driving a Mini Morris, and uh, he let me drive it around Chen Chita, around the back lots. Wow, what a car. I'd never had a car that you drive it like a, a go-kart. It was fantastic. Incredible thrill. And so uh, he would come and sit in the uh, camper with us and have uh, our chestini, a little packaged pre-cooked food that we would get. Delicious. Just delicious. We'd sit and talk there. And so you, you, was, were, you were good friends with Richard Harrison? Well, yeah, we became good friends and uh, very close. Uh, he's been to my house or houses many times and uh, stayed with us. And I've stayed with him as a bachelor and as a married man. And uh, we've traveled. We've seen each other around the world, across America. And, uh, yeah, we were very, very, very good friends. Any, any interesting uh, st uh, story on, on this film that you recall? Or is it on Jesse and Lester you remember? Well, this I think I only did one day. So there wasn't much to remember except <clears throat> the fight that I was in in the, the saloon and the, uh, was, that the was that, that film or Jesse and Lester? I can't remember. Which but... one is it, Tom? You didn't have anyway. fights in both films, John? No, I, I don't think I had a fight scene in uh, the Long Ride of Vengeance. Because I think he played a gambler. Yeah, I was a gambler. A, I was, this one. I was yeah. a gambler, but uh, anyway. Any anything about Anita Ekberg? Well, very beautiful. She was there in the Western set. I didn't have any interaction with her professionally, just to look at her. Of course, I knew who she was from La Dolce Vita. And uh, so I was very happy to, to work with her, to see her at all. And uh, I had no idea who Richard Harrison was. He was completely unknown in America, although he had, of course, worked on various rather important films in Hollywood and in the earliest part of his career, as you two know very well. Right. But his real name became popular and famous in, well, outside the U.S. And uh, I had no idea who he was. Well, yeah, he did a lot of peplum films, too, as well. Oh, yeah. Tom, well, what's, uh, what was the storyline behind this film? You know, this one's about a young woman named Deborah Carter, played by Dada Galati, who's forced to sell the family farm by the railroad, who is then robbed, raped, and murdered by bandits, <clears throat> led by a Mexican named Montana, played by Rick Battaglia. Returning from the War of Secession, the victim's brother, Jeff, played by Richard Harrison, decides to avenge her killing three of, the Mon of Montana's henchmen, it su succeeds seizing a woman to attract the Mexican into a fatal trap. Oh. It turns out that Jerome, played by Omero Gargana, the unfaithful servant of Deborah, to be the culprit who had joined them with Montana to bring about the tragedy. With his killing and the recovery of the gold stolen from his sister, Jeff concludes his revenge. Right, that, that plot's all over the place, Tom. It is, yep. <laughs> oh, man. So then after that, uh, John, you were in uh, another Richard Harrison uh, movie with Donald O'Brien, Jesse and Lester, two brothers in Trinity. You played an angry bank customer. What was it? It was your overdue. Uh, I was, have, was, uh, was I have no, Why were you so mad? I have no memory of being an, an angry bank customer. I was a <laughs> minor. I was a minor. So I what, too, why yeah. do you say angry bank customer? <laughs> What? Two credits. One of them says he's an angry bank customer, and the other one says he's a miner. But I figured the angry bank customer sounded better. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Did you get any gold as as the miner, uh, John? No, but I still have some dirt from the mine under this <laughs> fingernail. It's still there. Uh, yeah. Uh, you told us before the show that uh, Donald O'Brien was uh, very friendly. Yeah, he he was a very good actor. And of course, his career is, is very admirable. I mean, he had some great films that he did through his long life. And I think he's still alive now. Yeah, he passed away a year ago. Oh, is that too bad? Yeah, we finally learned out that he just passed away. That is a shame. Well, he was a very nice guy. We got along very well. I saw him uh, a couple of times uh, downtown Rome. Uh, for whatever reason, say hello or something. Maybe we met by accident. I don't know. 
I never saw him after that. And of course, some many years later, apparently he had an accident. Richard Harrison told me that he slipped in the shower. That's right. Yep. Wow. <clears throat> and he was paralyzed like half his body. So he, he went back to acting, but he had to do scenes like sitting in a chair or things like that. Didn't affect his voice or, or, or his mm. other arm, but it was almost like a stroke. But he did act, and eventually, apparently, he could get enough up to walk with a limp or something like that. So, uh huh. Well, it was terrible, terrible. I wonder how old he was when he died. Don't recall. Probably yeah. in his late eighties. Yeah. Wow. Tom, Tom, what was the the plot of this one? Well, Jesse and Lester is another one that goes all over the place. But basically, it's two antagonistic stepbrothers, Jesse, played by Richard Harrison, and Lester played by Donald O'Brien, inherit their uncle's land and immediately fall out as they begin pursuing opposite desires, one leading to a whorehouse, the other to a Mormon church in a town filled with crooks. So both, these guys are on both opposites. One's a, one's a Mormon and the other one's a typical ladies' man gambler, and they're only related because their father was the same. Right. And... Um... The, the big the, the big story Anderson about this one this. the big story about this one oh. Jay is it's it was directed written everything is is have to do with it is basically Richard Harrison oh that's uh, right he, yeah. he had directed it under James London he wrote the story uh, he basically controlled the film oh okay and I think we discussed that doesn't he think this is like one of his best films of all time well i think it's one of his best because of the hollywood style direction the camera setups the editing uh it looks really good yeah. and i think it's a very successful film i don't know what it made i think it cost him eighty thousand dollars to produce it uh we'd already become very good films when he did that and uh, i was seeing it on a regular basis and uh he was running around rome doing errands for the film and it was a co-production with a, an Italian friend of his named Piazza, and uh, he had to have a co-production to do it. But um, I thought it was well done. I, I was very impressed by it always, and I've seen it many times in many poor quality versions, and then it was released apparently in uh, uh, Blu-ray, I think. Mm. So that's something to look forward to. Right. And I think I actually have a copy of it in Blu-ray somewhere cool. or, or DVD, but the previous copies, of course, were terrible. So I think you should be very proud of that film. Uh, it was a beautiful film to, to work with. It, it had wonderful classic Western elements, I thought, that different from the Italian style. And um, I, I think I only had two or three days of work. In fact, it was very low budget. Mm -hmm. And uh, in that film, I only made 10,000 lira a day. Mm -hmm. That's it, huh? $6.30. Of wow. course, and, and the, the good food was very nice to have, too. And it was fun to be out in that western set, the mining set. I forget where we were. Do you know, Tom? Where was no, that? No, I don't. Uh, it wasn't. Uh, anyway, wherever that was, uh, it was fun. But that was the very end of the westerns and the end in fact uh, coming to be that it was i think september we were shooting it uh film work of course slowed down in the winter because it got colder and it could even snow but also the westerns as you both know very well were really just about dead in 71. well they were starting i think a couple more years before it actually did come to a, a screeching halt but yeah I think Tom says it's uh, heydays were what, 66 to 69, Tom? Uh, John, was, John and I were saying like 68 was the peak, so 67, 68, 69, and then it took a dip in 70, and then the Trinity movie came along in 70, 71, and that uh, jumped it back up, gave it a heartbeat, and then it started to fade. Well, t John, tell us, you have a, a, a Trinity story real quick. Well, <clears throat> I didn't even know the name of the film. I got a call from some casting director, who knows who it was, but I got a call, John, do you want to go out to Dino Cita at Dino De Laurentiis' studio, south of Rome, and uh, look for this person, I guess, and uh, do, a, do a film as an extra. So fine, I went down there, 
And uh, Vila Città, the, the studio, main studio, is this immense building in the middle of just flatness. It looks very strange, but it was very beautiful. But behind that main building was the Western set. So I walked over to it with uh, some other extras, and it was a beautifully done set. Uh, you could see I saw a little bit from of the inside, mainly on the outside. We were waiting to go in, and suddenly after an hour or something, they told us uh, they're not going to shoot it. Actually, someone mentioned there was a union problem. So I don't know what union. Was there a problem? Someone mentioned that. And so uh, they sent us home, but we were paid. Otherwise, I would have had some sort of a piece of that film, too. So we figured out it was the second Trinity film. My name is still Trinity. Oh, oh well, wow. Funny films. Too bad for me. I mean, <laughs> you know, the thing is, let's be fair. Let's be honest. We all know that primarily actors are hired because they fit the part physically where they've got something unusual about them that makes them stand out, gives color to the scene. You know, that's the only real attraction I had since everybody was dubbed, except for the main leads in English. Uh, you're not an actor so much as just a cardboard character being pushed around on a set, told to make this, uh, here's the dialogue, what can you do your face, you know, make a face of it, and that's about it. Otherwise, um, there's no real acting. When you get to real acting, you're talking about the great Italian actors that I so love tremendously, and they would usually dub themselves. Uh, those are the greats. Those are the ones that, that really made so much a difference in my life to watch them when the, the avant-garde cinemas in America were so popular in the 60s. And in, even in Oklahoma City, there were three cinemas that show the great Italian, the Bergman stuff, the Japanese, the British, the angry young man. Oh, they would show whatever was really happening big in the rest of the world. They'd bring them in, and we could sit down and watch them in these theaters, and we'd be so happy. They were just so, such a completely different way of making films. And the American classics, the golden age, that's, that's wonderful. But even in the 60s, the American films, uh, there were no real classics being made like they used to. All of a sudden, I was seeing Bergman with incredible everything. I was seeing spaghetti westerns with sets in the desert and zooms and cinematography that was dramatic and sometimes overblown and violence and guns and gunshots, exciting. And that element, you know, very rare to find an American film. Uh, Sam Peckinpah, John Ford, you know, the, there was the Italian exaggeration that was missing. And the exaggeration mm -hmm. the exaggeration was such a killer for everybody. Right. And speaking of uh, Italian films, we're going to take one step away from the Spaghetti Westerns, because that's where Jesse and Lester was your last one. You uh, were in and you worked on uh, Fellini's Roma, John. Tell us a little about that. Uh, I was um, just ended up being the... Uh, chief purchasing agent and audio recordist for a series of films uh, made in Europe, across Europe by Lyric Productions. Uh, we made a feature film and three documentaries. So I'd been with them for nine months and then they went to Russia and I couldn't go because I had so many cameras and back then the Russians had a limit on how many cameras anyone could take in. I would have had to have left all my cameras in Helsinki or something and then go for months and months across Europe and end up in the southern border and not have a single camera to take pictures. So I said, forget it. I said goodbye to the production company. I went to Spain. When I was in Spain, I picked up an issue of Variety after about six months of being in Spain. And I said, Fellini's going to shoot a new film. Well, Fellini, my favorite director, then, as now, <laughs> always will be probably, I said, oh, I've got to go back to Rome. I've got to find uh, Fellini. I've got to work with him. I've got to do whatever it takes. So I had my camper still. I drove back to, to Rome, saw my friend Henry Krzyzewski, who owned the film uh, business of renting the, the finest uh, cameras to uh, the best productions. And Henry was renting all the production cameras 
and uh, equipment to, to Fellini for Fellini's Roma. And he said, you want to meet him? Well, he's going to be, he's going to be, uh, that day, the first time I saw Fellini was uh, in Rome at the uh, Stadio Olimpico, which looks like an ancient Roman forum. And Fellini was shooting what turned out to be a black and white segment for Fellini's Roma, uh, supposed to be a, 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 sal a silent film. Uh, but anyway, there they were shooting outdoor set. So I'm walking over. I found the beautiful set, the cameras, the lights, everything. And there was this petite person sitting in a chair uh, facing the actors. And this person turned out to be a woman. And it turned out to be, well, there it's written right on his chair, Giulietta Messina, Fellini's wife, an actress that I had adored for so many years watching so many of her films. Um, he, Fellini wasn't right there with her, but I took my face. I said, I walked around. I said, hello. I didn't speak Italian well. I'm sure I said everything in English. Her English is beautiful. I said, hello, my name is John Delaney. I'd love to work with your husband. And she looked up at me with that cherubic smile, uh, just crazy. And she says, well, <clears throat> he's right over there. He's directing right now, and he'll come right over here, and you can meet him. Well, what a life. <laughs> <laughs> the Spielberg of Europe. Oh, here, you can meet him. No problem here. Uh, is he going to give me half of his sandwich, too, maybe? It's very informal. <laughs> So a few minutes later, he walks over. I reach, I extend my hand. I said, I'm John Delaney. Henry Kojitsky told me you're working over here. He recognized the name. And I said, I'd like to work with you. And he says, I, I don't have any jobs open. We've already cast everything. We already have the crew. I said, well, do you mind if I come out and watch you shoot? No. So I started going day after day there. And uh, outside, you knew you well, weren't going to be kicked off the set, John, because Fellini's giving you permission. Yeah, I had permission. They're not going to. They never kicked me off. Um, went out to Ostia for another scene. When we came back to Cinecittà, then the, there was a very dramatic scene in Fellini's Roma where you have uh, trucks full of cattle, and it, it, they're supposed to be driving on the big freeway, the autostrada there, and there's a tremendous scene at night. Uh, and in the rain, uh, the cattle were supposed to get out. They gave them injections uh, to put them to sleep, but the cattle wouldn't go to sleep. They were wandering around the, the autostrada, which was completely fabricated in the back lot of Chinichita, further out than the western, in fact, set. And uh, they wouldn't go to sleep. So actually, they had to kill them all. They killed the cattle. Oh, to wow. Get to get them to lay down. Oh, so they were, That's not, I didn't think that was the direction you were going, John. Yeah, they, they did. They killed them all. And uh, then the next day, we're shooting uh, another part of the autostrada scene. And uh, Fellini said, John, why don't you take your red Volkswagen pop top camper and drive down the autostrada this way? And when you get right in front of the camera, wave and look straight into the camera. <laughs> So that's what I did. I said, great, now I'm going to be in it. <laughs> and uh, then some months later, we're shooting one of the last scenes in the film, in Trastevere, and uh, Fellini says, or Maurizio Main, his AD. Uh, uh, well, I must say that I was the second AD to Fellini on various times because I could speak enough of Italian, barely, to understand what they needed. And there were many scenes with a lot of foreigners. The foreigners didn't speak Italian, but they spoke their own language, which may have been English. And if there wasn't, they spoke English well enough to understand. So uh, Fellini wanted Maurizio to tell me uh, tell, in English, go down there and tell these extras to move. Sometimes they were in cars, sometimes they were walking and trusted in Rome in different scenes tell them to do this and that. And uh, so off and on for some many months, I was, uh, with, uh, you have to say, I was the second AD to Fellini. Were, were you uncredited or credited? Uncredited. Wow. Uh, I, I could have put it in. But when I tried to put it in, I saw that some uh, uh, the, the second uh, unit 
people had taken the credit for a, a second AD. And I never worked with them. I never even saw them. Um, but then I thought, well, now if I put myself in a second AD, what, what, what are these people going to think? Right. And I said, you know, and now... But to be second AD uh, on Fellini's Roma, that's awesome, John. Yeah, for me, it's big, big. I mean, when I saw La Strada, La Notte di Cabiria, Nights of Cabiria, and all the other films, uh, one by one, I... I it, it moved me more than any director had ever moved me and consistently wow. with every single scene. And so he remains the biggest thing to me. I took so many slides back then people were taking slides. I had Hasselblad cameras and I was taking big four by five, I guess they were, but well, whatever they were big slides, beautiful. I have dozens of Fellini today. I have only two that I can find all the slides they were put in storage. I don't know where they are. Wow, mm -hmm. that's cr that's a fantastic look on story. look on eBay. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I have. I look every once in a while. My yeah. sister, my my parents died. I had them with my parents. Then my sister picked up everything that she wanted and whatever that was from their home. Uh, I didn't pick up anything, and uh, maybe my sister has it, but uh, I don't know. I'll never wow. know. Mm. There's some some great storytelling. Uh, John, uh, from your Spaghetti Western days, working with Fellini, uh, it's just a fantastic, I mean, uh, that you're still friends with the Richard Harrison to this day, correct? Well, we don't communicate too much anymore because uh, about five years ago, he invited me to go live at Villa Francesca, his wife's name is Francesca, uh, in Malibu. I'd been there dozens of times before in the years before. He said, because uh, uh, I was in the Philippines and I needed to come back and do some more work. I wasn't making, there's no way I could make money in the Philippines. My wife stayed there. And so I came back and I stayed and lived with them for about nine months, uh, five years ago. Um, but I could see in the first days that Richard was, unfortunately, he was very angry at many people. I won't go into the detail. Okay. But but extraordinarily angry for no real reason. And uh, it was pretty shocking. So you after, haven't spoken since then, I guess. After eight or nine months, uh, I could tell he's... he's Time I to said, move out. I better you, move on. Before I was say, he, your, your time is coming, huh? In, in the, <laughs> in the, you know, I've known him since 1971, whatever that is, 50 years or something. Right. Um, and we haven't... We have never had harsh words. We've never had a single harsh word. I've been with them, as they say, around the world. Uh, I've had incredible experience. I used to live in the guest bedroom of their house in Rome for months at a time, for years and years. Then I have property in Umbria. They would come up and stay with us. They stayed with us when we lived in Concord, stayed with us when we lived in Florida. And we drove around Europe together and different reasons. And, uh, then in the Philippines, uh, it was it was Richard that told me, John, I'm going to make some films in the Philippines. Why don't you come over and just come to the set and we'll have fun, which we always did. I said okay. <clears throat> and then the first uh, within the first 24 hours there, I was staying in uh, this beautiful hotel, and I saw this beautiful young Filipino girl, the receptionist, and. Uh, something clicked and uh, we've been married 36 years hmm. and i couldn't be happier no oh, man awesome. no, no man could be happier awesome and that's her that occasionally comes in here and asks for her makeup or something. <laughs> right well if you have you have no, her lipstick candy might as well give it to her yeah but uh john great stories um let me ask gave... let me ask one question did yeah, you ahead, ever Tom. do any any voice dubbing while you were over there I only did voice twice, once in the Philippines for some unknown film. I played a uh, bad guy and once in Rome for some reason, for some film that I have, I don't remember. Actually, I did dubbing in Hollywood. You know, I started acting again a few years ago in Hollywood. And my wife said I had nothing to do. And she said, <laughs> uh, well, why don't you start acting again? Acting, acting. 
<laughs> this is a thousand years since I last made a film. I said, this is Hollywood. There are 100,000 guys that look exactly like me and right. have all these years' experience, and they have agents, and everybody knows them, and they're always called. I'll never work. Well, gentlemen, I'm going to brag. In the 22 months that I was making films in Hollywood, I did 70, seven zero films. There you about, go. about 53 as the lead. I wasn't, I wasn't the lead in the feature films that I did, but I had, I was a featured actor in many of those. And, uh, but I was the lead. But, you know, you do, as an actor, you do all kinds of films, uh, short films, uh, PSAs, commercials, yeah. uh, PSAs. And so forth. So uh, I had fun. Doesn't pay too much. Pays more than it did in Italy. <laughs> but, <laughs> and I think the most I ever made per day was about three hundred sixty dollars. A Dutch production came over, right. and we shot in Santa Barbara. Cool. So uh, but, yeah. yeah. Well, it's been an honor, and uh, to have you here to discuss your years in uh, in Italy and in the Philippines, and. Um, yeah, as I said, you, you were in some very memorable films. The Return of Sabata is also like a classic, and you, you do steal the scene that you're in, whether you want to admit it or not. Very kind of you. And uh, we just want to say, if you want to go, all the films that uh, John was in, you could look for them. You just got, you know, when you see him, freeze frame it and appreciate it before you press play again. <laughs> right, Tom? That's right. Right. But um, we want to just say thank you once again for coming on to the show. And uh, Tom, any last words? Nope, I just want to say thanks to, again, John, for coming on. And uh, you're living in Washington now, so uh, uh, enjoy it up there. Uh, it's wonderful. What a wonderful state. It's fantastic. We love it. Absolutely. Awesome. So I just want to say uh, thank you to... Uh, all our fans out there for uh, joining us here on the uh, Spaghetti Westerns podcast. You can catch the best of all our, uh, most of them, or a good chunk of them on, we're streaming on iTunes, Spotify, and Anchor. Uh, all our different past episodes, and you can watch them, listen to them anytime you want, uh, and whether you're driving or you're at home. And so if you missed any past ones, uh, you could just go to those platforms and listen. We're also, of course, uh, on Facebook and on uh, on YouTube, all our episodes, if you want to watch them. So anyway, uh, Tom, I guess uh, we'll see you uh, next time. I hope so. I hope I'm still here. <laughs> jo uh, yeah. John, anything you want to say to your fans before we go? Uh, go to Italy, but stay for six months at least. Have Those fun. Get, are, you, are your, are your uh, homes available for rent? Uh, I thought about doing that, but unfortunately, there's no one in the village that can handle them for me. It's impossible. I, I wish, I wish, because, you know, but the, the other thing is COVID started, and so everybody, no one's yeah. renting. I have so many friends who own property over there, and it's a bad time for them. Wow. Yep. But yeah, go to Italy. Sounds like a plan. I haven't been yet. Tom, have you been? No, nope. been to Spain, but not Italy. Right. Well, we'll have to lot, go one day. When I, when I make my, when I'm shooting scenes for my spaghetti western, Tom, we'll all have to go there and stay in a villa somewhere. Oh yeah, and make sure it's a five thousand dollar per night villa. Right there, you go. Yeah. Otherwise, there's no <laughs> point. No point to going. That's but, right. Anyway, so uh, want to thank all of you for watching, and John, thanks for joining us. Thank Tom, you so very, very much. Say? Been a great pleasure for me. Tom. Yep. <laughs> what do we always say to everybody? Oh, Tom? adios, amigos. We say adios, amigos, and I always say adios, uh, compañeros. We'll see you next time on the Spaghetti Westerns podcast. Adios. Adios. adios.